back of Brentwood. Uh, my Lords, I am honoured to lead this debate on what remains a profoundly important issue of public health, tackling the spread of HIV and doing so in a way which, over time, would allow us to eliminate the virus, which has been responsible for so many deaths and so much suffering. I would like to thank all noble Lords for taking part. It is just over 35 years since the first reports in the US media of an unidentified illness which seemed disproportionately to affect gay men and to kill them. What was identified as a human immunodeficiency virus, an incurable disease, left a generation of those infected facing certain death. Many more living in its shadows had their lives shaped by it. That 35 years on, we have turned the horror of HIV AIDS from a death sentence into a manageable chronic condition through the use of antiretroviral treatment, and that we can today even begin to contemplate its elimination is a tribute to many brave and visionary people. There is not time to name them all tonight, but I want to make two exceptions. The first is to praise the campaigning groups, especially the National AIDS Trust and the Terence Higgins Trust, who fought tirelessly to keep this issue on the front line of the public health agenda. The second, on this very important day for him, is to recall the absolutely vital role our new Lord Speaker played in the earliest days of this epidemic. As Secretary of State Fowler, he showed enormous courage in tackling the issue and in doing so saved thousands of lives. Our gratitude to him is eternal. My Lords, HIV, as we know, is a massive global issue, but it also continues still to be one of the fastest growing serious health conditions here in the United Kingdom, with an estimated 6,000 new diagnoses last year, 115 a week, and the rate of new infection is increasing. 2014 saw the highest ever number of men who have sex with men diagnosed with HIV. Two-fifths of people were diagnosed late, long after they should have started treatment. One in six of those uh, with the virus still don't know their status. And for many of the 104,000 people living with HIV, economic hardship, stigma and discrimination are all too real. So if anything, despite the huge life-saving advances in treatment and care globally, the situation here in our own backyard, particularly with regard to testing and prevention, is deteriorating. We need to take tough and determined action to reverse the tide, and that will require a strategic approach from government to tackling every aspect of HIV, with the aim of eliminating transmission of the virus in the UK and bringing its reign of terror to an end. And, my Lords, for the first time, we have the ability to do just that, because we have at our disposal the means to stop transmission. As a study published last month showed, it's nearly impossible for someone living with HIV to pass on the virus if they're undergoing effective antiretroviral therapy and have an undetectable viral load. This is of profound importance in producing a strategy for tackling HIV, as we have seen in other countries. A recent study about HIV in Denmark from the University of California and Copenhagen University Hospital provided the first unambiguous evidence of the link between high rates of viral suppression and falling HIV incidence. Because of the Danish policy of treatment as prevention, HIV incidence among gay men, still the group most at risk, at 0.14% a year is now so low that it almost meets the annual incidence rate the World Health Organization has set as the threshold for eventually eliminating the epidemic. There is no reason why such a remarkable success should not happen here, given that we have exactly the same tools to use. But to do so, three things must happen. First, self-evidently, to cut transmission through the effective use of antiretrovirals, those who have the virus need to know about it and get on treatment. But far too many still don't, with devastating consequences. It is a terrible statistic, my Lords, that over 80% of all HIV transmissions in the UK are from the undiagnosed. So we need a step change in the volume of tests that are undertaken regularly by those at greatest risk and in access to testing. Yes, there has been much good progress and much innovation, the introduction of home testing kits, for example, but it is not enough. There should be much more routine testing of populations at risk, and more support needs to be given to GP and primary care providers uh, and, indeed, to local authorities to deliver it. 
And of course, there is a continuing need for publicity to explain its importance. I pay real tribute to the extraordinary example set by His Royal Highness <laughs> Prince Harry, whose live broadcast of his own HIV test has done more than anything else in recent times to raise the profile and make HIV testing the norm. Second, one of the major reasons people don't get tested is because they fear the stigma of a positive result. The People Living with HIV Stigma Survey 2015 revealed a continuing problem with HIV stigma and discrimination, with too many people reporting everything from verbal harassment or physical assault to exclusion by their families. Given the crucial role of stigma in encouraging testing, there is a strong case for a public information campaign to raise awareness and tackle some of the myths that still exist. I also commend to the Government the recent NAT report tackling HIV stigma, which draws together international best practice. Improving education about HIV and sexually transmitted illnesses more generally would also be of real benefit, especially as the, sh as the increase in HIV incidence among young people is particularly sharp, up 70 per cent in the last three years. It is time to look again at what is being taught about it, this, this issue particularly as Department of Education guidance is now 16 years old. It's really important for young people to understand about HIV and to learn how to avoid it through condom use, but also to be taught the importance of being supportive of those living with HIV and not to fear or stigmatise them. Finally, my Lords, while improved testing and tackling stigma will help identify those with the, who, with the, who have the virus and get them on treatment, the flip side of the same coin is preventing HIV by using medication to protect HIV-negative people from acquiring it. Again, we have the tools to hand in the shape of pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. Two studies, including the PROUD trial here in the UK, show PrEP to be highly effective at preventing HIV infection in men who have sex with men. <coughs> Properly taken, the success rate is well over 90%. This is a revolutionary development in the fight against HIV, which can transform the public health landscape. And only this week, new statistics uh, from San Francisco showed that it had cut its rate of new infection by a third in the last three years as a result of PrEP. But inevitably, as PrEP is a, drink, uh, is a drug linked with sex, it has become the subject of controversy and misinformation. It's argued that contracting HIV results from a lifestyle choice, and it is not appropriate for the NHS to pick up the pieces from such actions. But this ignores the point that the NHS is treating, curing, and indeed preventing illnesses diagnosed from lifestyle choices all the time. Cigarette smoking, overeating, overdrinking, riding a bike without a helmet, and PrEP should be no different. The other argument, of course, is money as it is estimated that it co could cost up to £20 million each year to provide. But, my Lords, that figure is dwarfed by the existing costs of HIV to the NHS. The lifetime cost of treating someone with HIV is now in the region of £380,000, and as people live longer, that figure will only increase. It is, frankly, Mickey Mouse economics to refuse to fund effective prevention measures for those most at risk at the cost of just £400 a month, a sum soon likely significantly to reduce, when you set that against the huge cost of, contract, of, of treating someone who contracts HIV. If PrEP uh, prevented just a handful of infections each year, it would easily be saving money for the NHS and for the taxpayer. Um, this is now, regrettably, a matter before the courts, but I hope that common sense will prevail and that the original decision in the case that there is no legal impediment to NHS England providing PrEP will be upheld. And that is vital because it is the last element in the jigsaw alongside effective <coughs> treatment, more testing, tackling stigma and promoting condom use, which will allow us finally to move towards the elimination of HIV transmission, something genuinely within our grasp. My Lord, earlier this year, the UK, as a member of the World Health Organization, committed to the goal of eliminating hepatitis C, another deadly condition, by 2030. NHS England is now working on plans to make the goal a reality through prevention, testing and treatment. We must have the same ambition for HIV. 
So I would ask my noble friend if the government will be as bold with HIV as it has been with hepatitis C, commit to the elimination of new transmissions by 2030 at the latest, and work with NHS England on a strategy to achieve that. My Lords, thanks to the miracles of genetic science, we now know where and when HIV began. We do not yet know when it will end, but end it must, and tonight's debate should be a staging post on that journey. In memory of the countless millions who have died, in deep honour of those who pioneered treatment and dispensed loving care, and in solidarity with those living with the virus, let this country have the ambition to show the way in consigning the greatest public health peril of our age to the history books. <clears throat> Warmest congratulations, my lords, are due to my noble friend, Lord Black of Brentford, for securing this important and particularly timely debate. The arrival of PrEP, the availability of PrEP, the benefit that it can provide is one that I hope all of us will support and urge strongly for. But even more timely, as he rightly pointed out, is the arrival of the first male Lord Speaker. Appreciate we've had most distinguished female Lord Speakers. Uh, previously, but maybe it's time now for a male Lord Speaker, and we welcome him most warmly on the Woolsack. And of course, as my noble friend has said, he, of all people, deserves enormous credit for his pioneering, his courageous campaign of don't die of ignorance, the shocking, the bold, the unstoppable campaign of 1987. My noble friend mentioned my Lord Fowler, uh, but also, I wanted to mention one other person who was the then Chief Medical Officer, an eminent uh, physician and epi epidemiologist, Sir Donald Acheson. Uncompromising, he on the whole thought ministers had to be tolerated, and so long as he got his way, which he was determined to do with great principle and distinction, uh, he was happy and easy to work with. But when he first became CMO in 1983, fewer than 30 AIDS cases had been seen. By 1985, two years later, 121 had died and 10,000 were thought to have been, have the condition. And that was the most phenomenal situation, the greatest new public health threat of the 20th century. And following that was really a model of the way in which a government can decide they're going to go onto a war footing uh, in regard to a new condition. I mean, not only was it the great public uh, health education campaign, the health service, the voluntary sector, my noble friend paid tribute to Terence Higgins Trust, to the National AIDS Trust, but the London Lighthouse, Milton in landmark. It was extraordinary when the voluntary sector mobilised, rather in the way that all the children's charities mobilised at the end of the 19th century holding the government to account in every possible way. And even the diplomatic service. So in my term of office, when I took over uh, at the Department of Health, only being half the man of the Lord Speaker, because of he, of course, manfully was able to handle both the enormous <coughs> Department of Health and the then Department for Social Security, now Department of Work and Pensions. No mere mortal, the Secretary of State, has been able to handle those two enormous responsibilities since then, but he did so with great distinction, so maybe he'll be quite the man to handle um, our, our noble lords and our colleagues' uh, business here. But at that time, there was a real problem internationally because in many African countries, uh, acknowledging uh, HIV uh, and the development of AIDS was thought to be a real threat to the tourism industry. I remember going to the World AIDS uh, Conference in Paris about 1990 or something, and the British ambassador in France, proud in his red ribbon, which his mother, I should think, would have been amazed to see him wear. The whole campaign was to try to persuade the Russians to accept that the HIV uh, and AIDS was a serious problem in Russia. So for all of us in our different times, we've had different campaigns to handle and to try to make sure that this particular real threat to the human race, which has been so extraordinarily through the work of our scientists, through the pharmaceutical industry, become a manageable chronic condition, if only, if only, it can be identified, uh, 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 diagnosed, and treated. Now, I do confess 
to attention I held in at my term of office because there was a resistance to testing when there was no available cure or treatment. I found this very difficult because without going into too much detail, any of the women in the house who've ever had a baby are tested for all sorts of things without any counselling or consent being given. Uh, that's what they're told they have to do. But nevertheless, at that time, it was felt that people shouldn't uh, be um, uh, uh, forced to have uh, uh, assessment or treatment, even if they were going into hospital for a, uh, a major uh, operation without counselling. And I tracked down where all this lay, and I then declared war in the most joyful way on the uh, insurance industry, because the ABI used to weight people uh, on their insurance if they'd had a, a, an HIV test. If it was a negative test, it didn't matter. The point was that they'd be, the fact they'd been tested meant they were obviously high risk, and therefore they should pay the penalty on their insurance uh, uh, um, payments. And so Prince Harry then would have been a wonderful example uh, of which one could have used uh, with great strength. I'm afraid I was just rather aggressive and rather insistent and rather disagreeable, but I'm delighted to say that if you uh, look at the ABI policies now, they're absolutely clear that a negative test ha has not, since 1994, been a barrier to obtaining insurance. So all the way through, we see the way in which the stigma, there's resistance, there are obstacles, and we together, I believe, can unite uh, to make sure that we work together to overcome these many barriers and improve uh, diagnosis and treatment. There's no doubt though, that those early campaign was in many ways a model, and a model that I think many of us felt proud of internationally. My noble friend has pointed out that we now have more to learn from other parts of the world who are in fact developing their services and their approach faster than us. But it remains that France, Spain, Italy, each have twice the number of people living with HIV as a percentage of the population as we, as we do in the UK. Globally, HIV has been responsible, as my noble friend said, for the deaths of over 35 million people worldwide. 1.1 million in 2015 alone. There is still a long way to go. The WHO reported in 2015 that there were approximately 26.7 million people living with HIV worldwide. South Africa, Zimbabwe, Uganda, 19%, 14.9%, 7% of the adult population living with HIV. In the UK, 0.3%, in the US, 0.6%. But any percentage, any numbers, are ones that we can't uh, tolerate without greater effort. The UN Sustainable Development Goals, established in 2015 to end poverty, fight inequality and injustice, includes the commitment to end the epidemic of AIDS by 2030. UN AIDS has set interim targets for 2020, which have been agreed by a political declaration by UN members, including the UK, back to the part we can play internationally as well as nationally. And the international may not be part of uh, noble friends may feel uh, of the debate today but in this extraordinarily permeable world with mass migration there's no such thing in my humble view as looking at uh, the situation in the UK without having regard to the international situation because such are the movement of people whatever the outcome of Brexit may be I doubt that we'll uh, bring an end to the uh, migration, mass migration of populations. And of course, we are not doing well enough, as my noble friend has pointed out, because we are still finding that one in six are unaware that they're living with HIV of those 100,000 people with HIV in the UK now. <coughs> Only 82% of those uh, 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 with HIV knowing that they actually have the condition. And of course, if a person's diagnosed a long time after they've been infected with HIV, it's more likely that the virus will already have seriously damaged their immune system. So late diagnosis is a huge contributing factor to illness and to death for people with HIV, and of course, to further transmission if the individual is unaware of the situation. 
So in 2014, it was estimated that 40% of the adults in the UK died. Sorry, I do apologise uh, for interrupting the noble lady, um, but she'll be aware that this is a time-limited debate. The guide time has been increased to eight minutes, but um, I hope she'll be seeking to conclude quite quickly. Thank you. Uh, I, I apologise to the House. Such is my enthusiasm to support my noble friend in his excellent work. I had another 40-minute speech here, <laughs> but I will now bring it to Sorry. an end and simply commend my noble friend and our most distinguished Lord Speaker once more and say I hope to support them in every way I can. It's a great um, pleasure to uh, follow my uh, noble uh, friend, Baroness uh, Bottom, as enthusiastic today as she was during the time which she held office with such distinction, the Secretary of State for Health. Uh, my Lords, in the last few years, the House has become accustomed to returning from time to time to this grave public health issue. And so often, the impetus has come from the noble Lord, Lord Fowler, an unwavering friend to all of us, regardless of party, who believes strongly that though very significant progress has been made, not least as a result of his courageous work in the 1980s, much remains to be done. Above all, I suggest the country at large needs to be made aware that the disappearance of stories of heart-rending agony from the front pages of our newspapers does not mean that a great crisis has been almost entirely resolved and that the political agenda no longer needs to make much provision for it. As we have heard, HIV continues to spread rapidly. Public opinion requires a wake-up call. In these circumstances, it surely must be right for us to press the government to commit itself firmly to the objective of eliminating this terrible scourge. My noble friend, Lord Black, a close personal friend for exactly 30 years, has performed a signal service by securing this most timely debate. Concerns about the prospects of steady further progress are accumulating to such an extent that serious anxiety now exists among the valiant organisations that work so hard on behalf of actual and potential HIV sufferers. Wide publicity has been given to one of the principal concerns, the delay in introducing a miraculous new drug. It is tragic that protracted action in the courts should have become necessary. It is tragic, too, that some have sought to create tensions between those dedicated to the relief of HIV and others suffering grave hardship from other sources. As my favourite Times columnist Janice Turner put it recently, at its heart the PrEP controversy shows where tolerance of gay lives ends. Uh, may I touch briefly on another of the many sources of concern? It is becoming evident that as a result of the Health and Social Care Act 2012, the provision of HIV and other sexual health services services is in danger of becoming seriously fragmented. The crux of the problem seems to be that the division of commissioning responsibilities between NHS England, clinical commissioning groups and local authorities is confusing and unclear. The damaging implications have been the focus of a detailed inquiry by the all-party group on HIV and AIDS. Its report will be published shortly. In the light of it, the government will surely need to consider how they can ensure that HIV prevention and testing are not set back, particularly at a time of falling local authority budgets. It will also need to clarify where the responsibility for commissioning HIV support services actually rests. Uh, finally, my Lords, may I say a word about Northern Ireland, for this debate relates to the whole United Kingdom. Uh, I've always been particularly interested in all that happens there, including during the time that my noble friend Lord Pryor's father was its deeply committed 
Secretary of State over 30 years ago. The greatest concern of Positive Life, Northern Ireland's only HIV-specific charity, is the heavy stigma that still attaches to HIV in the province. They are pressing for investment in education and for the raising of greater awareness in both schools and the wider community. They state there has been little communication with the public since the 1980s, and a recent public health advertising campaign did little to address the misinformation and myths that surround the condition. There could be no more telling reminder of the continuing need to combat prejudice wherever ever it arises, a point made repeatedly by the noble Lord Lord Fowler and emphasised in his book, AIDS Don't Die of Prejudice. Policy in Northern Ireland is, of course, determined at Stormont, but its leaders must always be able to look to the government here for an unwavering, resolute approach to combating HIV and for encouragement to emulate it. Thank you, my Lords. I'd like to start by thanking Lord uh, Blackall Brentwood for this not just timely but very important debate. Um, I personally believe that the good work that's happened with HIV prevention, HIV treatment in the UK is now at a crossroads because of public policy. Maybe not intentional, but we are at a crossroads and it's going to need political leadership not the courts, but political leadership, to deal with the um, increasing number of HIV infections that are actually happening in the UK. And I will come back to that in a moment. It is very nice to see uh, our new Lord Speaker, Lord Fowler, sat in his uh, place, um, his new place, because his voice has been uh, not just important, but actually has been critical in terms of the um, fight against HIV, not just in the UK, but across the world. And uh, many people owe, uh, many thousands and millions of people owe him personal gratitude for the work that he's done. I'm not going to concentrate significantly on the key issues which have already been raised about education, um, access to testing, treatment uh, and stigma, although I will come back to stigma slightly uh, in what I've got to say. I want to major uh, on one issue, and that's the issue of PrEP. Uh, PrEP, which is becoming uh, a uh, vaccine to stop the, um, the, 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 the um, replication and the transmission of HI, uh, uh, HIV within the UK. A, 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 a treatment that is uh, widely available in France, in America, in the US, in Israel um, and in Kenya and other countries that are doing it. And actually a, um, a, a treatment which um, the Public Health England modelled uh, that um, if PrEP was widely available uh, to uh, high-risk groups, particularly men who have sex with men, um, it could prevent 7,400 cases by 2020. could prevent 7,400 cases uh, by 2020. Um, uh, many have uh, already referred to the Proud uh, survey, which, uh, study, which shows that 86%, uh, it's 86% effective in, in preventing HIV transmission, and also the cost. Lord, uh, uh, Lord Black of Brentwood made very clear that uh, uh, the lifetime cost of treating somebody with HIV is up to £380,000. The cost of uh, PrEP is uh, £400 a month. It's the equivalent of 83 years' worth of PrEP to treat one person living with HIV. 83 years. The economics are not questionable in terms of the cost of PrEP. So how have we got to the position, my lords, where two government or two parts of government are literally slogging it out in the courts for who's going to pay for this preventative treatment? How have we got to that stage? Interestingly, uh, the Minister, uh, I'm sure, is aware, both parts of government funded by the Department of Health. Local government's prevention funded by the Department of Health, NHS England funded by uh, by. Uh, uh, the Department of Health. I asked a question in July, House of Lords question 1425, which asked the Minister, um, what, um, what stops the Secretary of State from intervening and asking the Department of Health to commission PrEP? I got a very nice answer about uh, NICE, but I didn't get the answer. So I'd ask the Minister, what legislation stops the Secretary of State tonight 
agreeing or telling NHS England that it can um, commission PrEP. What law stops that? Uh, the own advice given to NHS England made it very clear that that could actually happen. So I'm interested to know uh, why that doesn't happen, particularly when the NHS national plan puts prevention at the heart of future health care. And the whole argument about why NHS England can't uh, provide PrEP is because it's a prevention measure. Well, if the whole NHS five-year plan is about prevention, then why can't the NHS step up to do this? There is a lack of political leadership my lords, in this issue. Not a lack of managerial leadership, although there is, I think, at NHS England's point, there is a lack of direction from the centre to say that PrEP is so important, as the studies have shown, that it should be commissioned by NHS England. And I have to declare an interest here that my partner uh, works uh, for NHS England in specialised commissioning. doesn't have anything to do with this particular area, but I think it's an interest that needs to be on the record. And the reason that political leadership is needed is because NHS England, I think, are taking a particularly aggressive and nasty approach in terms of uh, PrEP and uh, the arguments why it can't be used. A statement by Dr Jonathan Fielden on the 2nd of August, on the day of the judgment, uh, who is, he is the, medical, uh, the Deputy Medical Director of NHS England and the um, Director of Specialised Commissioning, at best, that statement was unfortunate and, at worst, showed institutionalised homophobic language by NHS England. And I use those words not to make effect, but they are. And I'll read out what the statement actually said. Because it was highly emotive, highly charged and used language which I don't think is deserving of a senior doctor of this country. He said it is to prevent HIV transmission, particularly for men who have high-risk sex condomless sex with multiple partners. He then went on to compare it to not being able to afford treatment for children with cystic fibrosis or children who didn't have limbs. This is clearly an attempt to try to put in the public mind the deserving and non-deserving people who deserve specialised commissioning. This is not the kind of approach or language we would expect from our National Health Service. And the reason is because a number of noble lords have already said it creates a stigma. If one of our national treasures, our National Health Service, a senior doctor in the commissioning part of our health service is using that kind of language and that kind of deserving, non-deserving language, it's not acceptable. So I ask the Minister, does the Minister agree to both the sentiment and the tone of that press release? And if not, will he say exactly why he disagrees with what uh, the um, Deputy Director, uh, Medical Director of NHS England says? I also come up to the final part because of time, and that is to do with the pharmaceutical company um, who is actually uh, producing and ma manufacture and marketing uh, the drug uh, Trivuda, which is um, the uh, PrEP drug of, of choice in the UK. It is clearly about to come off patent very, very near. So what discussions have the government had to reduce the cost? Because one of the issues is to do with cost, i.e. the NHS England can't afford it, or uh, local government can't afford it. And can I just say on local government, somebody who has been a, a councillor, a council leader, and actually still is a councillor, the issue with local authorities by it, I can go to any, um, any clinic at all, any sexual uh, clinic in the country, uh, and I can go there, if it's a preventative measure, uh, be anonymous uh, and get PrEP. But if, if it was down to one local authority to give way on this, everybody would go there. If this is a national health service and a national preventative uh, service that we're trying to do, there is only, uh, uh, provide, there is only one organisation that can provide that on a national level, and that is the National Health Service. And that's why it's important that the, national, uh, the NHS England uh, really is asked to look more seriously and more uh, urgently at uh, providing uh, PrEP as part of its uh, national health service provision. I would just hope, because um, I'm aware of my time too, I would just hope that the government does discuss with the uh, pharmaceutical industry, and in particular the company that's uh, promoting this drug, to reduce costs, because that way, even if it was to go through NICE, the cost-effectiveness question would be unanswerable. My Lords, I join with uh, other of your Lordships in congratulating my noble friend on securing this debate. It's an incredibly important subject, and it's particularly important personally for me. 
uh, 20, just over 23 years ago, my parents, my two sisters, and I lost my older brother to AIDS. Uh, he had contracted HIV some seven years previously. Uh, that was at a time when um, the uh, whole treatment of HIV and AIDS was at an early stage. Uh, I often reflect, as I think of him, that had he contracted HIV even five years later, uh, he might very well be still with us today, because uh, one of the things to celebrate in this otherwise quite gloomy story is that uh, the medical advances have meant that uh, HIV is today uh, not the death sentence that it was for my brother Charles, but a chronic uh, condition which can be managed uh, and managed successfully. But it's also a, a pleasure to see uh, you, Lord Speaker, on, on the world sack and, and to recall and celebrate uh, what you did bravely uh, at, at that time in, in the middle uh, 19, uh, 1980s. Uh, in, in leading that uh, campaign, brave campaign, uh, of public information uh, on the transmission of, of, of HIV. Uh, I had a very minor walk-on part at that time as the very young whip attached to the DHSS and was in a number of those meetings. I wasn't um, obviously privy to any meetings the Lord Speaker would have had with the Prime Minister at the time. Uh, but I like to think that the Prime Minister being of the time, being a scientist, would have been readily persuaded uh, of the need for um, urgent uh, action on this. But it is the case that there was at that stage um, a huge stigma uh, attaching to the condition, which undoubtedly deterred many from seeking, um, from going through a test. And, and my no right honourable and noble friend, Baroness Bottomley, talked about the uh, action of the uh, of the ABI and the insurance companies, uh, which certainly deterred many people from, from having tests uh, which they would otherwise ha have done. Uh, but but uh, I think the role the Lord Speaker played at that time is a hist one of historic importance and one of which he should be enormously proud. Uh, I have one or two reflections on the uh, points made by uh, other of your Lordships in this uh, important debate. It's, it's uh, my, no my noble friend, Lord Black, is completely right um, that you cannot separate uh, the issues of treatment and prevention. They are, in the case of HIV, uh, very, very closely relied because we know that the more effective the treatment of people who are HIV positive, the less the spread will be. Uh, if the, there is a huge premium on people with HIV being treated effect and treated effectively uh, with treatments which are easier uh, for, for people to uh, take and, uh, and keep taking uh, so that the viral load is, is lowered and therefore the transmission will be, will be less. And so the, and obviously the more effective the pretension, prevention, the less the need uh, for treatment. So the, we have to think of these two things, prevention and treatment, not as separate things, but, uh, but, but the same. Uh, and a reflection, one or two reflections on the uh, vexed issue of, of PrEP, which um, our other noble lords have, have spoken about. Uh, and I do urge uh, my noble friend, the minister, uh, to take back to the department the concerns, I think, of many in this house, that this is not a good way for the government to be proceeding, quite apart from the fact, I mean, we're told that the cost of, uh, 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 of PrEP being uh, available is some £20 million uh, a year. Well, um, after the lawyers have had their cut from protracted legal action and several appeals, I doubt whether there's much change left out of £20 million. Uh, pounds. And we know, we absolutely know for sure that the cost of people becoming infected with HIV is huge and protracted and continuing. And, and of course, because of the way in which uh, uh, our government operates, and this is not a feature of the current government, this goes back to the middle of the 19th century, uh, we have a very siloed approach to government. And so the argument here is, uh, as the noble Lord Lord Scriven said, uh, this is an argument between two different bits of government. Yes. Um, local government, but in this case, local government is the agent of central government. This isn't even different pockets um, uh, within the 
uh, taxpayers' uh, uh, disbursements. Uh, and uh, the, the reality is these are, the, these are taxpayer pounds that we're talking about, and they, we, they need to be used the best um, they can be. A key factor in the success of uh, our society as people live longer will be how good we are at keeping people well living independently at home. And more and more as we live longer, uh, more people will be living with chronic illnesses. And the cost of them being sick and needing active treatment, hospital treatment particularly, aren't just borne by the health service. There are social care costs attached to it. Uh, as people's working lives are extended, as they certainly will be, there will be costs when people are sick from the loss of tax revenues. There are additional costs of welfare support uh, for carers. Uh, and the truth is that these costs are dispersed both in different pockets of the taxpayers' uh, funds, but also over time. Uh, and we are not well equipped in government to understand the benefits or to uh, harvest the benefits uh, of savings that will come later from spending modest amounts uh, of money now. now these are, we, are, we still suffer from analogue structures. I noticed uh, Nick Clegg, the former Deputy Prime Minister, was quoted in, I think, the, one of the newspapers this morning saying how frustrating he found it as Deputy Prime Minister uh, that uh, uh, we have analogue structures and processes of decision-taking which are ill-equipped to deal with the pressures uh, and the tempo of the digital age, and I completely understand and sympathise with those frustrations. But more important in this context is the analogue structure, the model, as I say, deriving from the mid-19th century, uh, with a theology of departmental sovereignty that's intolerant of central decision-taking and which makes it unbelievably hard to justify relatively modest expenditure in one part of the state apparatus, uh, which, uh, uh, because the consequential savings are dispersed over many different budgets. In this case, both the costs and revenue losses of central government, uh, cost to the NHS, cost to local government. Uh, and we need to find better ways of, of doing this. Uh, and uh, I hope in some way the debate that uh, my noble friend has initiated on that subject will help us to make some progress towards that. My Lords, I thank the Noble Lord Black for initiating this debate, and I also agree with him and what the Noble Lord, Lord Moore has just said, that prevention, treat testing, and treatment are part of the same health care which needs to be joined up. And what we're talking today about prevention, particularly the use of PrEP, the pre-exposure antiviral treatment to reduce incidence of HIV, which <coughs> the debate is about elimination of HIV, and we now have the possibility to do that. And we fail to do this if we don't address this issue urgently. Reducing incidence and eliminating HIV requires biomedical intervention, behavioral intervention, and structural intervention. But we also have to adopt any new treatment or preventative uh, treatments that come along. I was interested to read what the, what the Health Committee, in his recent report that was published last week, had to say about our public health strategy. We welcome the focus on public health, he said, but recognize that reducing health inequality we also need to address the wider determinations, including environment. This will require cross-government working. We recommend that the Cabinet Office Minister be given specific responsibility at a national level to do this. And I wonder if the Minister would ever comment on that, or what the Public Health Committee had to say. Local authorities face a number of challenges and have had to cope rapidly with major system change. In addition, they face a real-term £200 million reduction in their allocation. Cuts to public health and services they deliver are a false economy, as they not only add to the future cost of health and social care, as exemplified by the cost of treating a patient with HIV, as opposed to the cost of prevention that many others have mentioned. They go on to say, commissioning for certain services is divided between different bodies, 
creating the potential for confusion and fragmentation, where progress on resolving them is in the best interest of patient and the public health. Sexual health provides a clear example of such fragmentation responsibility for and funding of pre-exposure prophylaxis, i.e. PrEP for HIV, as many other lords have mentioned. Let me just come back to why PrEP is so important. Others have mentioned the evidence that is now published in two studies, the PROUD and the Ypres-Gay studies. They both found that PrEP was 86% effective, has already been mentioned, i.e. it stopped 17 out of every 20 HIV infections. They tested different ways of taking PrEP. <coughs> In PROUD, it was daily dosage. In Ypres-Gay study, it was intermittent PrEP. Despite that, both ways of taking PrEP are effective, so it, it doesn't have to be taken on a daily basis. Studies with heterosexual men and women equally showed that PrEP works well in people who are able to take it consistently. For example, an African study showed that it was 75% effective, i.e. it stopped 15 out of 20 HIV infections that would have happened without PrEP. PrEP is needed if HIV infections are to start going down in UK and even eliminate it, especially in gay men. It is estimated that 2,800 gay men in UK acquired HIV in 2014, about eight gay men getting HIV every day. PrEP is necessary in England because while condoms, testing, and treating HIV-positive people are just about containing the HIV epidemic at its current level, infections in gay men are not decreasing, and more and more gay men are living with HIV every year. PrEP will save money, as already been mentioned, because the cost of treating an HIV patient is so high compared to uh, prescribing. Now let me also address some of the other issues that had come out in the debate between who pays, whether it's NHS England or the local authorities. Instead of a debate about who pays, we got confused about the clinical efficacy of uh, PrEP, which is absolutely convincing good study shows that it is highly effective. So that should not cloud the judgment about who pays. There were also other issues that came out that will lead to other unintended consequences, such as what about condoms and PrEP? Well, there is little evidence that providing PrEP will result in big changes in condom use. People who use condom carry on using condoms. People who don't use condom, particularly gay sexual men having sex with other men, they are the ones who need to be targeted. The other one was other sexually transmitted infection. None of them, by the way, are as serious as HIV, but there is little sign of PrEP causing rises in other SI, STI in any studies. The other thing mentioned was the side effects. Well, PrEP rarely causes side effects. The other issue was resistance. They were created resistant to drug. There is no evidence that PrEP will lead to many more cases of HIV drug resistance. resistance. And the cost-effective models have already been mentioned, but in the studies conducted, there were other different cost-effective models used. All of them found to be effective. The bottom line is given to gay men at high risk of HIV, PrEP would be cost effective or could even start saving money now, especially if it is as effective as it was in the PROUD study, and if at least a proportion of users take it intermittently. Even taken intermittently, it is effective. So there is no reason why we should not introduce this now. The argument about who pays needs to stop. Is the same taxpayer pays at the end of the day. It's only an issue about who tells who to start introducing this treatment. I hope the noble minister um, will respond positively to that. My lords, may I also uh, congratulate the noble lord, Lord Black of uh, Blackheath. Uh, 
of, uh, of Brentwood, sorry, for introducing this very important debate and on a particularly serendipitous moment uh, <coughs> on the very first day uh, of the noble Lord, Lord Fowler's taking his place as the Lord Speaker. And I'd like to join uh, in, uh, with those who have expressed their admiration for his vision and energy. There are not many of us in this house who can say that we've saved hundreds, if not thousands, of lives, but the noble Lord, Lord, uh, Lord Fowler did. <clears throat> My Lords, one of the subsidiary UN Sustainable Development Goals is to end the epidemic of AIDS, by which is meant HIV, by 2030. And UN AIDS has set, set interim targets for 2020, which have been agreed by UN members, including the UK. Individual nations are expected to develop a national strategy for HIV. However, England has not had one since 2010, and that is what we have been exploring this evening in this debate. So my first question for the Noble Lord, the Minister, is why not? We have the tools now, and how sad it is, as we have heard from the Noble Lord, Lord Maud, uh, who lost his dear brother many years ago in the early days of HIV infection, uh, that if the tools that we have today had been available then, many of us would not have lost close family members and close friends. I too lost a dear friend years ago in the early days and still mourn and remember what a lovely person he was and feel so sad that it happened at a time when research was in its early stages. <clears throat> My Lords, part of the problem, as we have heard, is that although we do quite well on treatment, we're falling behind on diagnosis. Thousands of people have undiagnosed HIV, and that means they will pass it on without knowing it. They will also develop associated conditions for which proper treatment will be difficult because of the undiagnosed HIV. Since April 2013, prevention of ill health generally has been funded from the ring-fenced public health budgets of local authorities. But while NHS funding has been protected, public health has been subject, as we have heard, to repeated government cuts, 200 million in one year. And I and others have lamented this in the House many times. And uh, this, of course, also, we're also being told that there will be further cuts of 3.9% a year over the next five years. And government proposals to abandon the ring fence or even uh, fund public health through business rates could further lessen the funds available for this work. Now, HIV prevention funding is already inadequate to meet changing needs and behaviours, and a fraction of what it was 15 years ago. It's also 55 times less the amount that is spent on HIV treatment. Now, in this situation, a more effective and widely available preventive, a prevention strategy really is needed. If we can have a strategy on hepatitis C, why not on HIV? And of course, HIV prevention needs a strategy because it requires a combination approach, including traditional forms of outreach, sexual health counselling, condom schemes, harm reduction, and of course, and I say this because the, particularly because the noble lady, Baroness Gould of Potter Newton, is not able to be with us this evening, and she and I both share an interest in this, good sex education in schools, frank discussion of the risks and how young people can protect themselves, and that's what is needed. Information is power when it comes to health, as the noble Lord, Lord Fowler, proved in his campaign so many years ago. Most HIV sufferers are very responsible about their condition. However, the majority of onward transmissions occur when the transmitter is not aware that he or she has AIDS. The majority of those already diagnosed are in treatment. And since treatment reduces viral load to the point where transmission is almost impossible, new cases are not coming from there. They're coming from people who don't know they have the disease. So better diagnosis is essential to defeating the epidemic. So why then, when diagnoses are rising, <coughs> does the NHS refuse to make use of PrEP or refuse to fund it, the most effective preventive treatment yet devised, as we have heard very clearly? And then appeals the decision of the High Court. 
I find it very difficult to understand that the NHS wants to spend its money on lawyers instead of treatments. We have to balance the actual cost of treating a patient pre-infection against treating the disease if it happens, and, and the loss to the public purse of the talents and taxes that would be paid by that person if he or she was fit and healthy and not suffering from HIV. My Lord's prevention has long been at the heart of our NHS. Vaccination was one of the most beneficial discoveries of medical science and has been used over the years to save lives and, they, and to save the NHS many billions of pounds. Those of us who are war babies will remember that we had orange juice to put up our vitamin C level when we couldn't get citrus fruits and cod liver oil to give us vitamins A and D, make sure we didn't get rickets. So programmes such as that uh, saved a lot of ill health and saved the NHS billions of pounds. So surely then pre-infection prophylaxis of such a dangerous disease corresponds to many of these vaccination and supplement programmes that have saved the lives of babies and children over the years. Now, in order for diagnosis to be improved, we need an effective programme of testing, as we have heard. But in 2014-15, contrary to national guidelines, 60% of high prevalence local authorities did not commission any HIV testing outside of the sexual health clinic setting. And this is probably because they're so cash-strapped. Putting the financial burden of PrEP on them is not going to help the diagnosis rate. And it also will not help them to provide the support that many patients need to take their medication. Because HIV medication, on the whole, requires a high level of, of adherence, and some patients need support and help with that. So we need a proper strategy, including PrEP, available on the NHS to people in risk groups, and not just for the sake of those actually at risk, but for the sake of the many people to whom th those patients might transmit the disease in the future. My Lords, we must be realistic. Risky behaviours happen, and we have to live with that fact. But unless we protect those who take part in them from infection, we're failing to protect the whole population. My Lords, if the international community can help very poor African countries to eliminate a very highly infectious disease like Ebola, why cannot a wealthy country like this eliminate HIV? We should get on and do it. We know how to, but as others have said, it needs leadership. My Lords, I too very much welcome the debate uh, and the thrust of the noble Lord, Lord Black's argument for the elimination of HIV. Uh, and like many other noble lords, I echo the tribute he made, first of all, to organisations like the AIDS Trust and the Terence Higgins Trust, and of course to the noble lord, Lord Fowler, who it's uh, marvellous to see um, in the Speaker's chair tonight. The noble Baroness Lady Bottomley mentioned Sir Donald Atchison as the um, powerful, dynamic Chief Medical Officer of the time, and I think it's right that uh, we should remember the role that the Chief Medical Officers have played um, in this story over, over many years. Um, the noble lord in opening his debate reminded us that of course HIV is a global issue but, and the UK has played a proud role um, in global efforts but uh, it remains a major challenge in, in the UK. Both the noble lord, Lord Patel, and the noble baroness Lady Wormsley have referred to some of, of the statistics. But I think, my lords, um, for me, the two most striking are it, the 2014 statistics showing over 6,000 people were diagnosed, uh, new people were diagnosed with the HIV in the UK, and that an estimated 18,000 people in the same year were living with HIV and were unaware of their infection. And it seems to me that the argument that the noble lord has put forward for testing and for publicity about testing is a very important one, and I hope that the noble lord, the minister, will be able to respond positively in that regard. Because, my lords, the issue then leads us into the wider question of, of stigma uh, and tackling stigma. And I very much commend Lord Black's argument for a public information campaign. 
I, I would link it, though, as the noble Baroness Lady Wormsley has, with sex and relationship uh, education. Uh, this is vitally important, but the statistics are frightening. Um, we know that only 40% of secondary uh, schools in the state-maintained sector actually have proper sex and relationship education on the curriculum. Primary schools, academies and free schools do not need to teach SRE. Uh, and my Lords, I don't think this is right. Uh, and I hope the Noble Lords Department is in earnest discussions with the Department for Education about seeing a proper change in policy in this area. The Noble Lord mentioned that uh, the last government's um, advice around these areas was produced 16 years ago, and it's the same in relation to sex and relationship education guidance. If ever there is a need for new guidance, my Lord says, lots has, of water has flowed under the bridge in those 16 years, not least the introduction of same-sex marriages. Um, we now have the mass use of mobile phones, the internet, and all the issues in social media that that brings in relation to sex and relationships. Uh, and I do think, my Lords, the government needs to look at this very carefully indeed. Uh, I don't think there's much for me to add in relation to PrEP, because Noble Lords have covered this uh, very adequately indeed. The argument for its use is overwhelming. The economic case is also overwhelming if we look at this in the round rather than through a very narrow um, departmental view. Uh, my Lords, it, it has never really been explained why NHS England has taken this perverse point of view. Um, and it, it's equally puzzling as to why they're carrying on with the case. Uh, having been comprehensively sort of uh, shown uh, in the judgment that the errors of their ways. I'm also puzzled why ministers have simply not called in the chairman of NHS England and told him to really sort his body out, because we've had no cohesive explanation as to what this is. I, I completely put aside the, the argument that's been put that this should be for local government. I mean, my Lord, that is a nonsensical argument which nobody in the field uh, believes is true at all. Clearly, it's a device to avoid NHS England committing itself to the expenditure of this money. I think they should come clean on that, if, if it is. And indeed, the press release that the noble Lord Lord Scrivens referred to probably is, uh, when it comes to it, if you, if you look beneath the emotive language, essentially that's, that's what it's saying. I agree with him that... Um, for many of the organisations involved in specialist services, uh, they feel that blackmail is being undertaken by NHS England at the moment. And that really, uh, it, it's a hard word to use. But when a senior official, a medical official, starts talking about making comparisons between people who indulge in high-risk sex and children with cystic fibrosis, I really do think that that was a disgraceful use of words. And I'm surprised that ministers have not called that official uh, to account. Uh, my Lords, of course, we all know in the current climate there are very hard choices being made. But, my Lords, I, at the end of the day, I cannot believe that ministers do not think that PrEP should be funded. And I think... Um, the Noble Lord may quote to me the 2012 Act in terms of the relationship between ministers and the NHS executive, but he knows only too well that at the end of the day, ministers are accountable to Parliament, and in the end, they should discharge that accountability. My Lords, um, the other area, of course, is, is just in relation to public health budgets, and again, the Noble Lord Lexton uh, pointed out one of the problems of the 2012 Act, which is the fragmentation of effort in this area. Um, and there are two issues here. One is that there is fragmentation between local government and the health service. Second, uh, that some local authorities are not taking their responsibility seriously. Um, other local authorities, particularly those in the big city areas, actually are having a greater pressure put upon them because individuals' patients are going to them because their own local services are, are, are not available. 
Uh, and again, my Lords, this is something that does need some review, probably working in partnership with the Local Government Association to see if we can iron out the inconsistencies. But of course, the other issue is the issue of public health budgets, which have taken more than their fair share of, of, of reductions as a result of the financial stringency. And it does make it very difficult to make sense of the overall five-year forward plan of NHS England, which promotes public health uh, and prevention, and yet in the budgetary decisions seems to detract from the ability of those services to play their full part. So, my Lords, I do think that this has been an excellent debate. Um, I endorse the uh, points of view put forward by all noble lords, but above all, it would be very nice if the Minister were to say it is the Government's um, intention and aim to actually subscribe to the thrust of the Noble Lord's uh, um, motion before us tonight, but above all, that it's going to actually sort out some of these problems, particularly, my Lord, the issue of PrEP and the integration of services between health and local government. Um, well, my Lords, it's been a, I think it's been a very, very good debate, actually. I think every, everyone who's contributed to the debate has had something uh, of interest uh, to say. Um, and for me, it, actually, it's a bit of a wake-up call. And in a sense, I think, perhaps I, along with others, a number of people have reflected this in their speeches, have thought somehow this problem had been sorted out. Um, and it clearly hasn't been sorted out. Um, um, my noble friend, um, Lord Maud, talked about the tragedy of his own brother. Of course, for him, it wasn't sorted out, but I, I felt that since then, we've made huge progress. And of course, we have made huge progress. And I, I just would like to um, echo my noble friend, Baroness Bottomley's comments about our new Lord Speaker, who I feel his presence sort of glaring down at me today on this issue. He said that to me, not all that long ago, that when he went to this new role, he wouldn't be able to pester me about um, long-term sustainability of the NHS, but I, I can feel his presence there um, this evening. And I thought that um, my noble friend, um, Lord Black, made a, made a really outstanding speech and sort of brought all the threads of the arguments together. Um, if I could just pick out a few individual points that were raised. Um, I, know, I know Jonathan Fielden, who's the Deputy Medical Director at uh, NHS England. He is, he is a very humane, decent, experienced doctor. I think he would be horrified uh, to feel that what he said or how he said it, um, I haven't seen exactly what he said, was sort of interpreted in the way that it has been done so. And I will certainly, I will write to him uh, just with a copy of the transcript of this and I, I will entirely leave it up to him how he would like to respond to that. I'm sure the last thing that he would want to do would be to leave the impression that he's clearly left uh, with, the, with the noble Lord Lord Scriven and indeed um, with Lord Hunt. Um, my noble friend, um, Lord Maud, talking about really cross-ministerial or cross-government, um, how difficult it is for one department to bear the cost when the benefit's being received by another department. I think it is worth saying in this case, of course, that the cost of treatment um, does lie with NHS England. Uh, so it, it seems to be entirely reasonable that the cost of you know, prevention should also lie with NHS England, so that it is at least within the same budget. I mean, when my, um, when Lord, uh, the noble Lord Lord Patel talked about a cross-government minister, all my experience of cross-government ministers is they don't, they're not all that effective. The, the, the silos that we have created in British government are, are, are very strong. Um, the noble Lord also raised, he, he, he drew, I think, the comparison with the strategy around hepatitis C. In a sense, we do face the same kind of problem in hepatitis C as we do in PrEP, as we do in a countless other drugs, that there is a limit to the money we have available. There is a cost. Uh, he, he, the noble Lord says, well, it will all end up with the taxpayer. The fact is, the taxpayer has given us a certain amount of money in, in the NHS. Uh, there's a lot of that we'd like to spend on hepatitis C, on PrEP, and other, uh, or more on treatment for hepatitis C and PrEP and other drugs. But simply, you know, we don't have the money to spend uh, always in the way that we would like to do so. Now, if I could just um, turn, I think, to, um, um, to the speech that I had already prepared beforehand. And I think it does fall short in some respects of, the, of, of what I'm asked to do this evening. And I'm, I, I was very struck just listening to the, the quality of the debate, just that um, 
I'm not, anyway, you'll have, to be, you'll have to be the judge of my speech more, more than I am myself. But as I said, I was hugely impressed by what's been said this evening, and I'm sure it will have a big impact um, outside this chamber as well as inside it. Um, the NHS does, I think, I think it is just worth restating this, it does provide excellent treatment and care for people living with, NH with HIV. Um, the success of our treatment services means that the UK is already ahead in meeting two of the three ambition, uh, ambitions of UNA's 1990-90. 90% of people with HIV being diagnosed, 90% uh, on ARV treatment, and 90% viral suppression for those on ARV treatment by 2020. In 2014, of all people attending for care, 91% were on treatment, of whom 95% were virally suppressed and very likely to be to, uh, very unlikely to be in, infectious um, to others. So on two of those UN um, goals, you know, we have achieved over 90%. There are other positive indicators of success. Late diagnosis of, of HIV, this is a diagnosis which is made after the point at which treatment is recommended, declined from 50% of diagnosis in 2010 to 40% in 2013, but it is still too high. Reducing late diagnosis remains important since people diagnosed late have a tenfold increase of death, uh, likelihood of death in the first year of diagnosis compared to those diagnosed promptly. Uh, reducing late diagnosis is included as, as an indicator in the public health outcomes framework. We are also reducing the proportion of people with undiagnosed HIV down to about 17% in 2014 from an estimated 25% in 2010. So more progress is needed to reach the global goal, but things are improving in the right direction. I, I have been doing a little bit of work with a, one of Bruce Keogh, the medical director of NHS England's um, fellows, uh, who, is, um, a, uh, who is a specialist in, in HIV, and she did just send me a, a note. And she, I should say that she is very supportive of PrEP. Um, I wouldn't want to um, mischaracterize her view. She is very supportive of PrEP. She says that around 80% of HIV infections in men who have sex with men are transmitted by the 20% of individuals who are unaware that they are HIV positive. Uh, she tells me that people who are not aware of their diagnosis do not make the same effort to modify their behavior, for example, the consistent use of condoms to reduce transmission. And undiagnosed individuals are not on treatment, so have high levels of HIV virus in the blood which makes them more likely to pass on the infection to others. So there is no, I think, dispute between us about the importance it is of, of early diagnosis. Overall, new diagnosis of HIV remains stable, with an estimated 6,151 new diagnoses in 2014, up very slightly from 6,000 in 2013. Now, of course, we must not be complacent. Uh, we know there is much more that needs to be done to reduce the new number of HIV infections, especially in men who have sex with men, where we continue to see increases in new infections. We also know that transmission is continuing among black African men and women who are acquiring their infection uh, within the UK. So what are we doing um, to really tackle the rates of, uh, to, to really tackle, uh, rates of HIV infection? We must increase regular HIV testing and promote safer sexual behaviour, particularly condom use. In England, the government continues to invest £2.4 million each year into national HIV prevention. This funding is allocated across three main areas. First, funding has been allocated to seven new innovative local HIV prevention projects. Activities being undertaken include providing full sexual health screening, in, in saunas and other similar premises, um, to, to working with faith leaders to promote HIV prevention and testing among black and minority ethnic communities. A further round of funding for 2016 and 17 was announced in June of this year. The successful projects will be announced in September. We will we'll be building on the learning from the year one projects as we move forward. Second, we know that early testing and diagnosis reduce the risk of onward transmission of HIV. This is the basis of the new HIV home sampling service, which my, no that my noble friend Lord Black referred to, one of the first of its kind. 27,173 HIV self-sampling kits were ordered between November 15 and May 16. 
13,992 kits were returned, of which 197, that's 1.4 per cent, were reactive. This is encouraging, given the challenge of identifying those living with undiagnosed HIV. Central funding was provided through PHE until January 2016, when the service transitioned to local authorities, and 80 are now signed up to funding the service. PHE will be looking to build on these numbers moving forward. The third and final strand of funding is from the Terence Higgins Trust, who have been awarded a new contract to lead and manage a national partnership to deliver information and resources to improve the proportion of individuals in highest risk populations who are able to make safe and sustainable sexual health choices and reduce HIV incidence. The programme will focus on social marketing, local HIV prevention activity, as well as monitoring and evaluation activities. But I can turn now to PrEP. Um, PrEP, as I think most noble lords will know, is a new use of HIV drugs that has shown clinical effectiveness in research trials at preventing HIV in people at higher risk of getting HIV. The trials recruited men who have sex with men engaged in high-risk behaviours and people with HIV-positive partners. This is the PROUD uh, clinical trial. And as noble lords have mentioned, it has been extremely successful. It is important to note that the drug used for PrEP, Truvada, is not yet licensed for this use in the UK. It is only licensed for treatment, not for um, prevention. However, progress is being made with an application to the EMA, and a licence is expected to be granted very shortly. PrEP should not be seen as a silver bullet, and is only one of a range of activities to tackle HIV. As with any new intervention, PrEP will need to be properly assessed in relation to clinical and cost effectiveness, including how it compares with other existing cost effective approaches, to see how it could be commissioned in the most sustainable and integrated way. The NICE evidence review is considering the published evidence on PrEP and will be published shortly. We do know, however, that cost effectiveness is very sensitive to HIV incidence in the target population and effective targeting, the adherence to taking the medication, which affects clinical effectiveness, although I was interested by the comments from the noble Lord Lord Patel about the intermittently taking the drug and the cost of PrEP drugs. Um, as time is running out, I, I, I want to say that uh, there has been criticism about, about the handling of this by NHS England. Um, NHS England have provided an assurance that all the proposals considered as part of their prioritisation process will be subject to the same robust assessment of clinical and cost effectiveness and relative prioritisation within the resources available, as well as the impact on people from vulnerable and protected groups. I felt that the that the leader in the Times um, got the balance pretty much about right when they said there are, there are reasons to resist the conclusion that HIV prevention should be left to the HIV positive. Few will be comfortable if the state stepped back from HIV treatment altogether, just as it will be thought indecent of a society to let smokers die of lung cancer or allow the obese to succumb to heart disease on the basis that such illnesses are behaviourally induced. There is absolutely no intention at all on NHS England's part or the government's part to any way discriminate against, um, against the use of PrEP because of lifestyle choices that people make. I can give that absolute assurance to uh, noble lords um, in this House. Um, the, the, the appeal is taking place on September the 15th, and I cannot comment on any more about, the, um, about that particular court, about the court case. Um, but I can assure noble lords that the, uh, the, whether or not th that the, the decision to um, use PrEP or not will be, will be assessed in, in an absolutely normal way. I will just make one last comment. I don't, think, I do, I don't expect this would be uh, agreed by some, uh, a number, by some members of this House. That the decision about, about which drugs to prioritise, how to prioritise drugs, should surely, be made, it should surely be made by clinicians. It should surely be made by NHS England and not by politicians. I know that the noble lord is, is shaking his head, but that is the whole sort of thrust of the, of the way that the NHS has been set up, that actually that the, the, the involvement in politicians in picking one drug against another drug is, is not surely the right way forward. But I have to leave it on, on as it sounds this evening.